The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Along with the rest of the nation, we were stunned on our Peninsula TV election night show when Donald Trump was elected president. The past six months seem to have offered one more stunning moment after another. We try to gain some perspective with our election night experts. The game is politics. The game is on. This is what it was like on election night here at Peninsula TV. It's it's stunning. It's just stunning to me. Um, he's up by 1.3 million votes nationally. Um, he's ahead in Pennsylvania, I think, by about 80,000, and that's been growing over the last half hour. 97% uh, of the vote is in. Um, there's something that's keeping you know, even Fox News, CNN, any of them from calling that race. I'm not sure what it is. The 2016 election was a time when the conventional wisdom proved to be neither. What happened? Where are we now and where are we going? Tough questions, and I'm not sure it's fair to ask them of our guests, but we will anyway. We're joined by longtime political insider and observer Bob Marks. Bob, back home at the game. And Melissa Michelson, a true and insightful political scientist at Menlo College. Uh, well, we had a few months to digest what was clearly stunning to all of us on election night. I, we sat here, we were having trouble believing. We kept thinking something was going to change. And I know, uh, as you noted in the clip that we just had, Bob, the networks kept holding off announcing yeah. it, too. I think they couldn't quite believe it either. Uh, let's go back a little bit and ask, you know, why did Trump win and how much of that was Hillary lost? Bob, what, you first. Okay. Well, I, I think it was a combination of both. And I think Trump won because... He had a very strong base, and which overperformed uh, in the I-4 corridor in Florida, overperformed in Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Uh, he was able to turn Barack Obama counties into Donald Trump counties, which was something that I don't think any of us really saw coming. Well, and he, he knew how to speak to them. Mm -hmm. He spoke to them in a way that the, the sort of the conventional system didn't fully understand. He was speaking to a base that hurt him and got him, when it looks like a lot of other people didn't, Melissa. A lot of people underestimated Donald Trump, and I think part of that is why he won, because the media expected Hillary to win. And so the media was harder on her, thinking, well, we, you know, we got to make sure that we're not criticized for being too soft on her after she wins. Mm -hmm. Obama apparently didn't do more to push back against Russian meddling with the election or releasing information because, again, he didn't want to make it look like he was trying to influence the election, right? Comey, as director of the FBI, was trying to make sure that he didn't look like he was interfering. But all of those decisions by the campaigns, by the candidates, by Obama, by the FBI, were made with the expectation that, of course, Hillary was going to win. And, and I think, in part, Trump won because so many people took steps to not make it look like they were helping Hillary win. And, you know, those margins of victory in those states like Ohio and Pennsylvania were very small. It just took a little bit of error and a little bit of super strong Trump enthusiasm among these, these voters to, to turn the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. I think there was another factor uh, which we're still seeing today, and that's in major respected, at least historically, polling outfits. And what we saw in the election is that they really didn't understand what was happening with this race. Uh, and we're, and I, I still believe we're seeing that today. Yeah. I think that Trump's approval ratings, you know, you read in the paper, Trump approval rating drops to 36 percent, lowest in, in history and all of that. Uh, I think that's misleading because they're polling, in, in terms of Gallup, they're polling all adults. Uh, or a number of the other major polling outfits are polling all registered voters. So it makes the anti-Trump people feel good. It feeds into the narrative, but it isn't reality. And I believe that Trump's approval rating is about six to seven points higher than what we're seeing today conventionally. I also think they're oversampling young voters. Mm -hmm. I think that, that was a, a big problem with this 
the race. Because they were worried they were undersampling, yeah. so they overcompensated. Yeah. Yeah. Before we leave uh, 2016 election, the, there's got to be a part of this in which Hillary didn't help herself. I'm thinking of her campaigning in Arizona instead of some of these other swing states because they thought they were going to carry right. Arizona because for the she, first time since it became a state. She thought she had the Rust Belt. She thought maybe she could turn some of these historically red states. I think the campaign could have made some different decisions. But again, all the information they were getting from within the campaign, from the media, was that she was going to win. And then those states, right? So, yes, the campaign also made mistakes. So but there's also, no one factor that led to Trump's victory. Yeah, I, I, I think that also what Trump does to people is he forces people, even if they don't want to, get into this macho on macho, you know. And I think the Clinton campaign really wanted to take him on, really wanted to rub his face in it. And in a way, I think they lost their way yeah. along. Well, that was the other thing, is it, it, you know, whether you liked what he stood for or not, I mean, a lot of conversations were, can you believe what this guy said? For her, I don't know what the main theme of her campaign was. I don't know what her critical message was. Right. I think she had trouble for The her. advertisements from Trump were partly anti-Hillary, but partly, I'm going to bring jobs back. I'm going to do this. And the Hillary campaign's message was mostly, oh my gosh, can you believe this guy? Yeah. And there, so there was a very negative anti-Trump message, but no clear, here's what I'm going to do as president message. And you got to give people something to vote for, not just something to vote against. So we're, we're, it seems like we're still stuck there because now we have uh, Trump against Democrats, Trump against Republicans, Trump against the world. There's this whole sort of combativeness uh, about his presidency that I don't think we've ever seen in, in the whole way in which he expresses himself. Um, saying things like just recently, you know, uh, the West must take a stand. I mean, it's old Cold War rhetoric, really, from, from another era. What, what's your take on the, the sort of current environment? We were talking off the air about there's so much chaos. Um, is that something that Trump thrives in? Is that something that's actually to his benefit? Or is it just the nature of things because uh, he's a chaotic character, Bob? I, I think that he, he does thrive in that. There's no question about that. Um, I think the reason that we're mostly seeing just chaos and uncertainty about where we're going is that the Democratic Party is still trying to yeah. figure itself out. Yeah. Are they going the direction of uh, Bernie Sanders and far left, you know, continuing to reach out to communities of color? Or, as some people are arguing, does this mean they have to reach back for those Rust Belt voters, those white rural voters who they lost the in Bill 2016? Clinton coalition, right, the, the 1996 election campaign that Bill Clinton ran. And the Democratic Party is tearing itself apart deciding which way to go about that. And so without a clear opposition plan moving forward, we that contributes to the chaos that is this Republican administration. Yeah. And I think that let's take a okay, quick break. Sure. We'll come, that gives you a chance to collect your thoughts. Now we're getting excited. Yes. <laughs> we'll come right back. We're gonna take a quick break. Are we living in a bubble? We are, and I think that's why all of our friends and neighbors and students are going to need a lot of explaining tomorrow, because if all of the people you talk to on a daily basis are voting, you know, 75, 80 percent for Democrats, how is Trump possible? Do you have class tomorrow? Yes, I do, at what, 10 o'clock. What are you going to tell people? What, how are you going to start the conversation? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Did, did I say Just Hillary kidding. was going to win the landslide? <laughs> I meant Trump was going to win in a narrow victory. Sorry. Well, that's I what I meant. Melissa, you, you know, you, you wore a pantsuit tonight, and a lot of women were... Uh, pantsuit Nation. <laughs> pantsuit Nation. And, and for a lot of women, uh, this was, uh, they thought, a really historic moment to uh, elect the first woman to the White House. Uh, what do you think went wrong for Secretary Clinton? Um, sexism. Okay. I'm going to take a wild guess that it's sexism, but I do want to correct you. She did. I think it's still being called for her that she's taking New Hampshire. Okay. It's only four electoral college votes, yeah. but it was one that was a swing state, so she got one. But of course, it's not enough, and it does look like Trump's going to win. And I think uh, women and girls around the country are, are going to be really disappointed when they wake up, I think. We're going to have a lot of explaining to do to our, our sisters and daughters and mothers. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. We have Bob Marks and Melissa Michelson. They were our live election night. Well, they're still live. They were our election night hosts uh, talking about the stunning win by Donald Trump. And now we're trying to sift through the ashes of all of that. Bob, you had a point you wanted to make about the chaos. Yeah, I think that 
what Trump voters want more than anything was somebody to go to Washington and shake things up. I think the anger, the just intense anger that exists out there is what's driving Trump. And what's interesting to me is if you look at the polling, say over the last month or so, um, the strongly support Trump continues to rise. So the more trouble Trump gets in, the more the media takes him on, the more everybody in the world takes him on, the stronger he is with his own voters. Yeah. There is that sense of, I, I know if, there were a fair number of people who voted for Obama and who voted for Trump, as paradoxical yeah. as that might seem, it was the same vote, which is, which let's change everything, let's shake everything up. Because you remember, a vote for Obama was a vote for change, right? Hope and change. Yeah. Um, the, the clip that we rolled into here was you saying that one of the reasons you thought Hillary lost was sexism. Uh, you still stand by that uh, evaluation? Absolutely. I think sexism played a huge role, and we continue to see it in uh, the Trump administration um, and the commentary that we see in the media and social media about what's going on under the Trump administration. There's a huge amount of sexism in um, in America and in American politics. Yeah. One of the other things that was uh, said in there uh, by you was that we're in a bubble. The, the, one of the things that makes it difficult to do political analysis from this particular vantage point is, I mean, do you know any Republicans? I mean, they're just, you know, mm -hmm. Bob and I used to know some. <laughs> you know, they've, yeah. they've been sent off to a, uh, a really nice farm in Montana where they were allowed to live out their years. Um, how hard is it to understand what's going on because we live in the Bay Area, Bob? I think it's, it's very difficult to understand. Um, and I, I took a couple of trips during the campaign period, one to Nevada, one to North Carolina. And that was really striking to me because I actually talked to people that love Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, and living in this area, even if there are people that love him, they're not going to open their mouth and say that. Yeah. So I, I think we are. You know, the divide in this country, the cultural divide, uh, is is immense, more than we've ever seen it before. Maybe since the Civil War. Yeah. What it, what has happened since the election actually is I found that people who are Republicans and including some who voted for Trump, right here in San Mateo County, yeah. were more willing to say that. The day after the election in class, I had students come in full of, you know, happy faces. Yeah, yes, we won. Yeah. You know, they were saying, yeah, I voted for Trump. I, I think he's awesome. And, and so it kind of popped the bubble in a way because it allowed Republicans and Trump supporters to, to come out it, um, it, on campus. It reminds me of the title of a classic uh, documentary on the Talking Heads called Stop Making Sense. It, it, it's hard to believe that this sort of chaos is going to con continue to benefit anybody. You know, you've got a Congress that doesn't seem capable of getting anything done. You've got one party in power. As we roll up to the midterm elections, it would nor in, under ordinary circumstances, this would spell a 30 to 50 seat swing to the Democrats. Is that something that's, you know, is the conventional wisdom just completely blown away or is there still the possibility that there's a return to, to, to some kind of political normalcy. Well, it's it certainly, it, it could happen. I think that we really, we just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I think that the issue that's out there, which could drive that kind of change, uh, is health care. And how that gets resolved, or if it gets resolved, could have a huge impact. Political scientists basically explain midterm elections with two variables. How popular is the president? How's the economy doing? What's my real per capita disposable income look like? If the polls are accurate or close to accurate and that Trump is very unpopular, then that's going to mean a lot of seats change parties to the Democrats. And then we don't know what the economy is going to look like next year. But those really are the two factors. People don't tend to vote on one issue. People don't tend to vote um, on anything except do they think the president's doing a good job and do they have spare cash? I would add into that a, a third thing, and that's who's going to vote. I think more and more that's becoming the issue that we really need to take a hard look at is who's actually, and historically... Who's allowed to vote. Yeah, well, that, that's true, too. But historically, midterms do not, you know, get the kind of turnout uh, that a presidential election does. People are more likely to come out and vote against. Just like people are more likely to complain than to give compliments, people are more likely to come out and vote to 
throw the bums out mm -hmm. than they are to just vote for the incumbent. Voting's expensive. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes thought. So unless you're mad about something and you want to see change, you're less likely to turn out. But then we also have voter ID laws, gerrymandered districts, and things that make it not necessarily a reflection of public opinion. So let's talk a little bit about um, the idea of, of the progressives versus the quote unquote moderates in the Democratic Party. Because as we've mentioned earlier, that's a party that seems in search of itself as well. Um, and Bob referenced that they were, the polling was oversampling younger voters. We have a changing demographic. How is that sorting itself out or is it, is part of the chaos that it hasn't sorted itself out yet, Melissa? Well, I think young people are just super cynical at this point. They're not sure if they should trust I mean, honestly, based on what, though? The I mean, they've had, they've had the best upbringing of uh, any generation in our time. I don't understand that. But they're well, also inundated like by social media and by information and by fake news and by fake stories, and they don't know who to believe, and they're cynical to begin with because they're young people. And so I think that makes them um, part of the chaos. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of times, I think, for the Democrats uh, to get out of this situation they're in. They need a compelling leader. Um, Bernie Sanders did that a little bit, but I'm not sure he's the guy. They need a new face and a compelling leader that's able to kind of stitch together both sides and bring them together in the common goal of defeating, you know, Trump and taking control of Congress. Yeah. At this point, uh, they have gotten nowhere. You know, the, the leadership of the Democratic Party is outdated. You talk about younger voters. How can they relate to a group of leaders that are in their 70s and even 80, 80 years old? Uh, so that needs to change. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's interesting. The New York Times just did a full page New York Times treatment on Kamala Harris. Um, She's been in office how many months? It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's But it, she's long been tagged as maybe yeah. part of the next generation, right. just well, like Cory yeah. Booker. And like, there are yeah. some names coming up, but... Okay, yeah. we'll get to I, that I in a second. We'll the Obama a, factor. Yeah, we'll get to that yeah. in a second. We'll have to take a break. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. Over here we have Bob Marks and Melissa Michelson, and we're uh, trying to sort through the Trump era. Um, we didn't talk about tweets, and um, uh, we, we, we all know what we can say that's good or bad about his tweets. Clearly, they are dominating the discussion as if it was an official White House statement. Um, and they have said these are official statements. Well, and why not? You know, because no. clearly he regards them as his own official statements. Is this a sea change in the dynamic? Is, is it a sea change in how people regard the presidency and also how you behave? You know, Obama, actually, if you go back far enough, JFK in, sort of invented the modern primary system by turning it into something so that an outsider essentially could win. Trump, I think, has done some of the same things to the, the political superstructure, including how he conducts himself through these tweets. Yeah, you know, uh, Sean Spicer said Trump has 110,000 followers, I mean, 110 million followers. On uh, He doesn't, but he does have across, you know, four or five different platforms about 95 million. Uh, and for him, the tweets are essential. It's his way of communicating directly with his people. Uh, cutting out everything else. I don't think we, we've never seen a president with that ability to do it and, uh, and the way that he does it. He well, does, I mean, he, but it's part Reagan, of the continuum. Reagan was known for doing it, but Reagan it spoke through to conventional means. Right. right, Reagan spoke to the public on TV and on the radio. Right. We've had the presidential radio address every weekend since FDR. Obama sent out tweets, mm -hmm. sent out social media messages. I actually think 
it's just part of a continuum of the president's trying to take away the middleman, speak directly to the public, and I think in a way that it's good. We should know what the president is thinking. We should be able to hear exactly what he's, what he's thinking. And we might kind of not want to look, but at the same time be unable to look away at the tweets. But we should know as the public, we should know what it is that our president is. The other thing is he's a master at turning people away from what they should be looking at. You know, uh, there was an, uh, they, they reinstated portions of his travel ban, but people were talking about Mika and Joe uh, on Morning Joe. And so he's, he's done that continuously. He's gotten people to talk about these things, to go crazy about these things, and he's taken the focus away from a lot of issues. But is that deliberate or is well, that it's, it's Trump It is Trump absolutely Trump. Is, is he that shrewd or is he that It's, it's absolutely deliberate. How do you know? If it's deliberate because I've heard him talk about it I've heard him talk about it. I've heard people around him talk about it well and, but he's also the kind of guy who would do something stupid and then act as though it was part well, of the master right, like yeah totally meant to tweet yeah, that yeah. not a mistake there, but there is no question whether it's purposeful or not it does obscure yeah. a lot of his yes. agenda but but again I think it's part of this continuum of presidents wanting to speak directly to the public and I think it's good for the public to have that unmediated look at this is who our leader is. Well, the other thing about the tweets is is that it, it cements that continuing it's us against them sort of mindset. He's taking on classic establishment Hollywood. Uh, well, the anti-media, you know, saying that these very established legitimate news sources are fake news, that is disturbing. That's yeah. slipping towards authoritarianism. That's you know, undermining the First Amendment. And if and if you can't trust, right, you should have unmediated access to your leaders, but you should also have mediated coverage. You should have that watchdog. And if, if he's undermining the watchdog and saying you can't trust the media to the point where people don't trust the mainstream media, then how do we know when the president is telling the truth? Well, but is he is he sowing distrust of the media or is he capitalizing on it? I mean, isn't there a huge amount of distrust toward the media anyway that he's just taking advantage of, Bob? Yeah. Yeah, he certainly he certainly is, and again, except the, for this show, of course, with which with is the media, your truth, the media, he drives people crazy, and they get out of their comfort zone. They do things that they wouldn't normally do, so it, it all feeds upon itself. It's what he did during the campaign. Yeah. He's, 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 he is a classic disruptor. Yeah. So, um, what does all this mean? <laughs> I mean, it's it has it's it's barely been six months. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's this pace that's incredible. There are a whole host of investigations underway, some of them much more serious than others, some of them much less politically driven than others. The whole question of, of his disclosure of his, his finances, which he has refused to do, um, you, know, you can assume that that means there's something there he wants to hide. I don't know how much it is that, in that he just doesn't want anybody getting into his business in that way. Do you see him serving out, first of all, all four years? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. do too. Um, is Weekly, there without major legislative accomplishments, but yes. The, is there a certain set of circumstances where you can envision him not staying for four years, either under his own power or because Congress finds a way to, to remove him? I, Congress isn't going to remove yeah. him. Yeah. I, I mean, the reality is the Democrats can jump up and down and say he's crazy and all that. He will go when the Republicans decide that he needs to go. And, and uh, that'll and, happen when he starts hurting them. Yeah. Which, which right. I gather, has that started to happen? No, I, I think in fact, he's, he's more popular with Republicans uh, than, than he was, certainly Republicans in Congress. Mm -hmm. he's, he's got a lot of detractors. He's got that same never Trump group that has always been there. But I think they're beginning to understand what he's like, how to deal with him. Uh, but, the, you know, all of this could change in a moment. Yeah. Getting, is, getting Neil Gorsuch yeah. on the court yeah. is seen as a huge yeah. win, and we're already seeing the payoff of yeah. that in terms of decisions out of the court. Now there's, you know, rumors that Kennedy might resign and that Trump would have an opportunity to appoint yet another Supreme Court justice, which the Democrats could not filibuster. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of Republicans, even those horrified by, by other things that the administration is doing, that's enough reason yeah. to just... Hold steady and let Trump continue to be president because one more nomination and they've got the courts locked up for the next generation. Well, there was a classic New York Times piece. I, I'm deeply upset by everything you're doing but your agenda. Um, right. So looking ahead, and we've got just a little bit of time to 2020, 
Does he run for re-election? And does he win? Uh, I think he will probably run for re-election. A lot will depend on, you know, where, where, what his standing is, where he's at, where he reads that. Does he win? Boy, I, I'm not ready to say one way or the other on that. I think he has a chance to win. I, I go against the common narrative that he'll just fade away. Uh, but uh, it's too early to tell. Yeah. And it, a lot depends on the Democrats and yeah. what, what they do. After my failure to predict the outcome <laughs> last year, I'm a little hesitant to predict any more future election outcomes. Yeah. Uh, but it really does come down to the same factors. How popular is he? How's the economy doing? Is, it, is the Democratic nominee going to be from the left, from the middle? Um, what, what, well, again, this right, we've got this internal battle going on in the Democratic Party. Is it going to be Kamala Harris or is it going to be Al Franken? And the direction they go as a party and who they come around um, with, that's going to determine part of the outcome, too, because that sexism and racism that was there in the past, that's still there. I think they need a, a new person, a new face that can straddle both sides mm. of, of that equation. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. Bob Marks, Melissa Michelson, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for coming back and revisiting uh, not just that long ago. Uh, and thank you for being with us. Um, and join us next time on The Game.